Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the podium, Michael Watt. Thank you. All right. Can I close this one here? Okay, good. Because that'll just bug me. Hi, everybody. Oh, can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me in the back? All right. I don't have any prizes. I'm sorry. Um, this is an am I did a lot of talks. I came from Apple. I was there for eight and a half years. And one of my crowning achievements of speaking as a nerd was speaking at WWDC, our Worldwide Developer Conference. And I do a lot of talking, but this is the first time I've actually like, felt like I'm back on a big, huge stage. It's totally intimidating, this huge screen, this beautiful room. So, all right, I'm going to be a little nervous for you right out of the gate. <clears throat> um, going to have some water first, and then we're going to start. How many designers in the audience? audience? Two designers? Really? Interesting. How many engineers or to-be engineers in the audience? OK. So no designer jokes. Got it. Or oh, you guys won't get them. That's fine. How many managers in the audience? How many leaders in the audience? Trick question. All right. Buy me a beer after. I'll explain I did what I did there. OK, here's a talk. Another Steve note before I start. If you uh, ever showing any sort of wire when you're giving a talk to anybody, he would have fired you. You think I'm kidding. OK. <laughs> Humans are bad. What in the hell is going on here? Now, you're looking at this, and you know that these are plugs. Um, but what the heck were we thinking when we designed all these different kinds of plugs? Why, this is as, a, as an engineer, as a designer of things, I look at this and I just see someone lost their mind. Now, there's a good reason behind each of these plugs. The reason the one from the UK is shaped how it's shaped is because they had a lack of some metal during World War II, so they had to have a certain shape of that plug. But this is a design nightmare. This is an engineering nightmare. If you've ever traveled before, you know part of your stress is sitting there going like, am I going to be able to plug into whatever the heck is sitting there on the wall? What happened here? This is too big of a design problem. It's too big of an engineering problem. Let's, but I'm gonna, let's look at it like this. Here's how this plug situation plays out around the world. What you're seeing here is the different kinds of plugs that I just showed you and where they're in use in different parts of the country, in different parts of the world. Pop quick, well, here's the thing. If you're in El Salvador, there are 10 different types of plugs in play. 10 different plugs, 10 different kinds of plugs. So you go over to Frank's house, and then you've got a one in 10 chance of being able to plug into the wall, right? What happened here? What was the design decisions that we ended up with all these different plugs? When I travel, when I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there plugging in this adapter into the wall, which is one plug, and I've got my plug going into the plug, so I've got a plug going into a plug into a plug. What happened here? There's too many stories there. I can't tell them all to you. I actually don't know them all. I want to talk about just one plug. Good thing to know right now. How many of you have Macs? OK. How many of you have an iPhone? Also good news. OK. It's actually not this plug I want to talk about. The plug I want to talk about is this one. What happened was, about a couple of years ago, um, when Steve Jobs is still alive, he got up on stage and he announced all of this new hardware. And he announced um, the fact, and what he did was, he said, oh, and by the way, this plug, this plug right here, that we, how many, how many of you have this plug on you right now? Right, okay, so a handful of you. <clears throat> There are a lot of these plugs out there. Every Mac, every iPhone, every iPod has this sort of plug. And Steve Jobs got up on stage and he said, <clears throat> we're going to give you a brand new plug. And so I was sitting there. He also redid the power plug, this one I have right over here. And I was sitting there going, oh my gosh, he just replaced every single plug in my house. 
Why did he do this? Is he, is he greedy? Is he, um, what was his reasoning about doing this? I want to talk a little bit about what the rationale about disrupting something as simple as plugs, what he was doing there. I want to talk about the people that are behind it. I want to talk about stables and volatiles. I'm Rands. I'm the guy on Twitter that sounds like a fortune cookie. That's what I do. I'm on there getting 140 characters of wisdom. Um, we said a little bit about um, what I did. Um, I was at Apple for eight and a half years. I worked, um, I managed the Mac OS X software team, part of it, and then um, I ran the online store. Store.apple.com, that's me. If you want to know why the little yellow sticky note comes out, I can tell you why. Um, after I left that, I left there about three and a half years, I left there about three and a half years ago. I work at a company which is probably, how many people know about Palantir? Well, that's really good news. How many are a little bit nervous about what I do? That's even better news. How many are lying to me right now and just don't want to get called on? I don't believe you guys. Anyway, I'm at Palantir. I'm one of the four executives Executives there. We don't really have titles there. I'm just one of the four directors that run the, run the place. There were about 1,300 people. We're in Palo Alto. We'll talk more about it in a little bit. But the reason I'm here is um, about three years into my Apple career, I started writing about a space that I thought was underserved, which was engineering um, leadership. A lot of the books out there are trash. Um, actually, they're probably really good. It's just engineers can't read them. We would go and we go like, this makes no sense to me. I don't know what this Drucker guy is talking about. Throw that away. Pick up wire. So um, I started writing about what I thought was an uh, opportunity, which was around how to talk about engineers, what engineers think about. And ended up, as I said, writing two books, uh, Managing Humans, which is a great book for uh, leaders or managers <laughs> um, who, uh, um, who are interested in the art of leadership. And then Being Geek is more of a career uh, handbook. It's for those folks who are kind of figuring out what um, they want to do with their career, engineering-wise. There's a couple of themes um, that um, I hit on a lot in these books, and they are relevant to um, the topic at hand. Number one, and this is something that was part of my intro, is this. How many of you have a job right now? OK. Um, here's a deal. I've seen a lot of resumes, like thousands of resumes. You're in a hurry. Right now, I'm pretty sure that whether or not um, you know it, you're three years away from your next gig. You are three years away. And if you're starting your first gig, you're about three years away. Now, how do I know this? I know this for two reasons. I look at resumes, and I just see this pattern on and on again, where engineers, designers, we leave after about three years. Why do we do that? What's going on? I'll tell you why. We're bo we, get, we bore easily. We bore super easily. Engineers are system thinkers. We think about it as the world as a flow chart. We have, this we have this idea in our head that we can design the perfect flow chart that's going to explain everything. This is not true. But we get to the point after about three years where the flow chart is pretty built out. And then we start getting bored. The other reason I know is because I have left my job consistently or changed my job significantly every three years. But you say, hey, Lop, Rands, whatever your name is, eight and a half years at Apple? What happened there? Let me tell you, three years, Mac OS 10 got bored. They said, hey, you should build a calendar server, a wiki server. I'm like, that sounds interesting. Let's go do that. Year and a half, got bored, moved on, went on to the store. Three years consistently. You are three years away from your next job. And you probably love your job right now. If you just started it or you're just about whatever, you might actually love it. Three years. You have an expiration date. Once you go into the workforce, you are going to have about a three-year window until you're going to be moving on to the next thing. The reason I left Apple was I couldn't see a path forward. And three and a half years ago, Apple was doing pretty well. It's actually still doing pretty well. I was so bored that I left Apple. My wife is still angry with me. <laughs> She's like, Palantir is doing really well. Why did you leave Apple, you idiot? <sighs> The other thing I know is that, how many of you build stuff? I think it's more. All right. <laughs> the other thing I know is this. How many of you have built a 1.0? Took something from the beginning to the end. 1.0. Really? 
more of you. Like little things. 1.0 doesn't have to mean that you like invented Twitter, right? You know, it could be something smaller than that. You, if you can imagine back to that 1.0, that creation of the brand new thing, the thing about it is it's awful. <laughs> it's really, really hard because you're sitting there making every decision for the first time. Which framework are we going to use? Ember.js? Or no? It goes on, it goes on, and it goes on, and you don't know exactly what winning looks like. You've got to make all the decisions, and you get done, and if you're in the Silicon Valley, there's a one in 10 chance, a nine, nine in 10 chance you're going to fail, but it's, going to, it's really, really hard. But people keep on doing this. Why do they do this? Why are we engineers doing this? I hate this word. This is an awful word. Hey, important question. MBAs in the audience, show of hands. Ooh, sorry. Can I make fun of you a little bit? My title is manager of software engineering. So okay, good, good. Okay, you're in good. So you can play both sides of the fence. Good. All right. Okay, that's good. All right. Um, this word used to mean something really, really interesting. Um, a bunch of douchebags who aren't MBAs grabbed it and they turned it into this sort of thing to kind of like talk about innovation, which is another word we lost. But this word really annoys me. But it's, there's a very important word inside of here. There's an important idea inside of disruption. And it comes from where I'm from, which is the Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley used to look like this. Poppies in California. Po California poppies, big huge orchards, and then something incredible happened and it turned into this disaster, um, which isn't a disaster, it's a lovely place. It's got 1,854 square miles and three million souls and incredible nerd density. A lot of folks out there. Now the question is, how did this happen? How did this happen? And when I was preparing for a talk a while ago, I did some research. How many of you, I know who started this. I know what he did and I know how much of an effect it had on the Silicon Valley. Excuse me. How many of you know who William Shockley is. Show of hands. If you're not part of the administration, tell me who he is. And the guy who already won the prize, you're disqualified immediately. Someone else. William Shockley. Yes. The transistor. That's correct. William Shockley is the Nobel Prize winning inventor of the transistor. William Shockley was also a jerk. This is actually a horrible human being. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> now, so what happened was, is this guy who was really smart um, moved himself uh, after he got the Nobel Prize, went out and, sorry, I'm a fastidious guy and stuff's on the floor. I feel better now. I also obsess about things. Um, so <laughs> the, um, William Shockley got his Nobel Prize. He was spending time polishing it. I don't know if you polish an all Nobel Prize, but maybe you do. Anyway, and he moved out to California and um, set up a shop in Palo Alto. Shockingly, uh, odd choice to do a technology startup. Um, and he attracted all this talent. He attracted all these amazing engineers who wanted to work with the guy who invented the transistor. He had this amazing set of folks around him that he attracted because they wanted to be there with him. And he was an awful human being. I can tell you stories about him that often, trust me when this is not, the least of which <laughs> was he was a really bad manager. He, um, what he did after about a year, the group that we now call the Traitorous Eight left uh, this garage or whatever was going on in Palo Alto and they went to go and form Fairchild, Semi Fairchild Semiconductor, which is where all this silicon showed up from. Is they started Intel, they started Fairchild, all these different companies and you think that's the point of my story and you think that's why it's called the Silicon Valley and that's all true. But the thing that's more interesting to me was their reaction to this horrible human being is resulted in a lot of engineering culture. When they went to Fairchild, they designed a brand new working culture. Remember, we're on the West Coast, we're on the East Coast. <clears throat> they got rid of titles. They got rid of titles in the companies because titles create artificial hierarchies. This is something at my company right now I'm wrestling with. I got 1,300 people and people are like, trying to figure out where they're growing and what their path is, and I will not let titles show up because titles start to turn into this. Oh, you're an engineer two? Well, I'm an engineer three. I, I said nothing. I said two, I said four words, but there's get, this get, weight gets on this and it starts to turn into this political thing. Well, I'm an engineering three and you're an engineering two, so I obviously have more power. This is a bad situation. They got rid of titles. They got rid of dress codes. They said, hey, I'm not gonna wear ties anymore. 
we're just going to be here in whatever outfits we want. They got rid of reserved parking lots. They invented the concept of stock options. Up until that point, it was only the executives who got the stock options, not the entire company. Insane. <clears throat> they created this thing called an egalitarian workplace. And um, it's something that, um, it's the reason you're wearing flip-flops right now. Who's uh, wearing flip-flops right now? Anyone? Show of hands right there in the back. Some flip-flops going on. There was a time this was really, really frowned upon. I already alluded to some of these aspects of what I think of a healthy engineering culture is. And then we'll get to stables and volatiles, I swear, but it relates to this. <clears throat> they really wanted to have a flat organization. Now, <clears throat> there's, two, um, there's two engineering models right now. There's the HP um, Apple model, which is leads have seven plus or minus three folks, and that's about good team size. The other model is sort of the Google model, where um, it's like one lead with like 100 direct reports. Now, the thing about Google you have to know is they have these vents in the ceiling, and outside of these vents pours money. And it just fills room. And that covers up for a lot of sins. <clears throat> Their model doesn't really, really scale. What Apple did, which I would say is the, one of the smallest big companies out there, is they took this model of seven plus or minus three, and what Steve Jobs did, and this is gonna sound like a lot of hierarchy, but it's really not, is he said, okay, for anything that Steve cared about, iTunes, uh, hardware, whatever it is, there was him, there was a, a VP, there was a director, lead, and that. So three levels of leadership between Steve and the team, that he, the product that he was caring about, which sounds like a lot, but if you go to Wells Fargo or these other big, huge companies with business units and directors and senior directors and all this political junk, it's really not that flat. And this is something we're doing at Palantir right now, is we're trying, how are we gonna keep it nice and flat? How are we gonna scale it like this? as opposed to like this. Because when it gets like this, the information gets lossy, and you don't know what's going on anymore. And people start to make decisions based not based on data, but do they know Emerson, or do they know you, or this sort of thing, and that's bad. And that started here. They said, we're gonna keep it flat. Everyone's out in the open, there's no offices, does this sound familiar? This is what they did. The thing you get out of that is you get speed. Less meetings, less of this alignment where you're sitting there and going like, okay, all of us have to get together, have a meeting to decide this thing that we could have just done by standing up and walking over there and saying, red or blue? Red, sounds good, let's go. They got speed out of this, work, this environment. Collaboration, the idea that people can just stumble on all each other. I was just upstairs, and you have these big, huge, wide open spaces. This is new in the last 10 years. We were all in offices with doors for a long time now, but we're going back to this model that was started back here in the early Silicon Valley where everyone just collaborates. You can just sit there and say, hey, what's going on, Frank? Tell me what's going on, what's your problem here? You can see what's going on, and a focus um, on results. The lack of a dress code, the informal dress code, is a byproduct of the values. Let's pay some premium on results. There's two tests at Palantir. This is not a recruiting pitch. I'm here as not represent, I am representing Palantir, but this is a story about Palantir. Anyway, um, there's two tests to get into Palantir. And there's different sounds depending on where you're standing. Test number one is really um, hard. We have to get hired. We have the hardest interview in the valley right now. We have the hardest interview. It's really hard. We turn away a lot of people. And then you get there, and there's that second test, and it's actually worse. The second test at Palantir is the following, and it comes with this focus on results orientation. You must quickly, in the first six months to a year, identify a major problem in the company. You must start to work on it. You must fix it and show that you can fix it. No one's going to tell you to do this. No one's going to help you in identifying it. It's just expected that you're gonna take it and be a self-starter and go solve that problem. Until the second test is passed, and by the way, there's no like ceremony when the second test is passed. Everyone just goes, oh, Marie, she crushed that recruiting thing. This is hard, but it's this focus on the engineering mindset is what have you produced? I don't care what you're wearing. I don't care what your title is. I don't care whether you're wearing flip-flops or not. What is the value that you're creating? This is the Zuckerberg era, as we're in right now. This is the hacker era, which is a great word. It's not a bad word. It's the same thing, it was the same thing for Netscape and for Palantir and for Apple, is engineers, if you go look at a lot of the companies in the Silicon Valley, there's this fascinating thing that's happened in the last 15 years. Google, Dropbox, Palantir, not Apple. Um, I'm forgetting one. Uh, oh, Cora. 
CEOs are engineers. This is a lovely time to be an engineer in the Silicon Valley. Engineers are risk takers. Here's the thing. You've heard this quote. I think this number is not valid anymore, but I'm still quoting it. If you have any other data to make it better, I'd love to hear it. The number right now is that one in 10 startups are successful. One in 10 startups are successful. If I told you that there was a 90% chance that you would walk out of this building and get hit by lightning, you would stay in the building. We'd stay here a while, I'm sure there's food. We would not leave. Why in the world, especially engineers, we're fact finders, we're database decision makers. Why in the world would you go do something when there's a 90% chance you're gonna fail? That, well first off, the money's really good right now. So there's a lot of jobs, so failing you can go to do something else. It's not the issue. We know the, the marketing version of this is fail fast and learn, but that is really actually true. <clears throat> embrace failure, we embrace failure because we like to learn. It's this boredom thing again. Anyone know who this is? Really? Okay, thank you. Whew. You always let me down. Gary Kasparov, playing speed chess against the entire Palantir engineering team. <laughs> There's this big table that comes out here, it goes all the way over there, and it's over there. And he is just killing us. We are just getting waxed. I wasn't here yet. <laughs> just boom, dead, boom, dead. Now the thing I like about this photo is not that we have Gary Kasparov playing against the engineering team on speed, on speed chess. It's the smiling faces behind it. You see all the people? No one said cheese. That's their, they're just, someone just took a shot. And you just look across there, there's people just smiling. Why are they smiling? This got waxed by Gary Kasparov at chess. Why are they smiling? They're smiling because they're learning. The master is sitting there killing them, but they know that they're gonna learn more because they're gonna see, oh, that's how he played. Did you see him do this? I know nothing about chess. Engineers love to learn. We love to learn. We love to puzzle. All these things about games and puzzles and Rubik's Cube, this is all true because we're stimulated by the idea of solving a problem. We like to build things, because building things are answers to problems. However, in what is the longest intro to a talk ever, there is a spectrum <laughs> to these, I swear I'll be 45 minutes. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a spectrum to these builders. There's stables, and there's volatiles. Now, these are um, archetypes. It's not black and white. People are never black and white. You are all beautiful snowflakes. So, um, I'm gonna talk about them like they're black and white, but at the end of the day, you're a little bit of this and you're a little bit of that. You're a mix of these things. But I like to speak in archetypes because it gets your attention. To give you the introduction to stables and volatiles, I have to talk about my first startup that you've never heard of and I don't ever talk about. And what happened was about three months before I got there, um, the, uh, <laughs> There's this guy named Stefan, and he was hired to be like our contractor, database wrangler, and to come in and solve some Oracle stuff. And he walked in, and Stefan, in about a week, said, there is no way in the world that this team is ever going to ship a product. He could smell it. We were just dealing with, like, got a PM, a project manager out there saying, oh, we're about nine months out, and, we're, and he was just like, this is never gonna happen. So he went and he grabbed Greg, and he said, Greg, by the way, we're gonna go lock you in the ping pong room. I'm gonna be in there as well. We're not leaving the ping pong room until it's done, until we can see the product. That we don't think, no one thinks is gonna be done for six months. And Greg's like, hey, this is interesting. He's new. He's like, this sounds really entertaining. Um, when's done? And, and Stefan goes, I have no idea. Let's just go. So he went in and he locked some folks in the, um, in the uh, ping pong room. He didn't actually lock them, of course. But um, several weeks later, um, the uh, ping pong room stunk. It reeked. And half of the engineering team had been in there doing a bender for like three or four days. And Greg was sitting there and gave us a demo of our product. This is about three weeks after they started. This is a thing that the project managers on the team were saying were six months away. And we saw our product. And everyone just went, hurrah! And of course, there was this building of it, and people were like, what's going on in the ping pong room? Where's Greg? What's going on? And of course, they started to accrete people, and they started to pull it together, but they sat there, and they built our product. And we were so happy, and everyone cheered, and they clapped. Not everyone was clapping. <laughs> Not everybody was clapping. Because 
Um, there was three folks over on that side of the room, kind of grizzled veterans of the Silicon Valley who were like, oh crap. Because <laughs> they'd seen Stefan before. They knew that, of course, this project manager wasn't off, made, wasn't off by a factor of whatever to get out to six months. Of course corners were cut. And they were kind of half clapping because they knew that they were probably going to have to clean it up when it fell over. <clears throat> Everyone thought he was a hero, but these three guys knew that Stefan was a type, an archetype that they'd seen many times before. Stefan was a volatile. And I want to explain to you who these different types of folks are. Volatiles, we'll talk about second. Stables, we'll talk about first. Archetypes, remember that. I'm not generalizing here. Stables, when it comes to engineers, when it comes to folks that build stuff, and I want you to close your eyes and imagine these folks, because you, you're going to start imagining someone. Uh, stables happily work with direction. They appreciate there appears to be a plan, although they may not know it. They just kind of assume it. They like schedules a lot. They're really good with schedules, dependencies. They love this stuff. They play nice with others. They, if, if, they really, really run efficiently. They value efficiently run no drama teams. These are team players. <clears throat> they calmly assess risk. They're really good with dependency mapping. They carefully work to mitigate failure, however distant or improbable it might seem. They tend to generate process because they know process creates predictability and measurability. How many of you like process? Show of hands. Four of you. Wait, wait, it keeps on coming up more. Interesting. Now, process to engineers is usually something we don't like a lot because it gets in the way of us getting to be creative, beautiful snowflakes. Now, the way to think about stables, as I was trying to try to figure out, it's, it's kind of like the stable thinking, if you will, is um, comes back to a, some research regarding um, consumer behavior. If I was to give you a choice between, and this is stables again, thinking, a $20 toaster and a slightly better, slightly better um, $30 toaster, of course, which one are you going to choose? You're not big on toast, you're just trying to get it done. It's just slightly better. You choose $20 toaster. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. If I go and I throw this, another toaster, into the mix, nothing else changes. That's why a $20 and our $30 model. Um, if I give you three choices, what the data shows is that you, you, the stable, will tend to move over to this one here. It's a thing called salience in decision making, which is a long Wikipedia page on it. But basically, we make decisions based on the most recent data that we have, which is a good thing. If we we're constantly making up decisions based on everything that ever happened and all these sorts of things, it'd be kind of crazy. But the idea is that we tend to make, this is a very, very stable decision. The unknown isn't scary, it's just that there's no reference point, so we use the data that we know. But there's times where we want the decision to be inventive and creative and disruptive, if you will. There's a time where we need Volatiles. They prefer to define strategy rather than follow it. They don't even factor failing into the math. It doesn't even, they're not even thinking that it could ever happen. They find a thrill in risk. These are the folks that will just charge at something. Let's go do it. We've got a weekend. Make it happen. They don't tend to build predictable or stable things, but they sure generate a lot of product. You're probably picturing some now. There's in the valley, there was this myth, it's true, well, maybe. It's about the 10x engineer, this person who just seems to generate that 10x more stuff. They do exist. They're not always volatiles, by the way. They are often only reliable if it's in their best interest. Trying to motivate these folks with schedules and it's the right thing to do for the team does not work. The way I usually get a volatile to do something with me is I describe it to them in a way like this. I say, hey, um, I've got this really hard problem. I don't want you to work on it um, <laughs> because it's impossible. <laughs> There's no way. And I, do you have any recommend? Because it's really hard. We need this. There's like a million dollars, like, but you can't work on it. 
Um, so if you could think of anyone who can do this thing that's really, really hard, I'm going to need a real hard algorithm person. And uh, You're not the person, obviously. <laughs> this just gets these volatiles going, because they get mad at you. And they're like, why do you mean I can't do that sort of thing? <clears throat> so that's some weird passive aggressive management technique that probably doesn't work for everybody, but it works for me. Um, they see working with others as time consuming and onerous. They prefer to work in small, autonomous teams. And they could care less how you feel. They've, and it's not that these are mean, awful people. It's just on their list of things that they care about. It's like 27, right? And all these other things up here are the things that are up there. It's not, they, they're not trying to be mean. They're just focused on these top 10 things, whatever those things are. If you go, if you go give these jerks this test, um, the $20 toaster, the $30 toaster, what they choose to do is they often choose to do something like flying toasters. Great. How many of you know this screensaver? Show of hands. All right. All right, most of you don't. I will explain to you this huge leap I just made into flying toasters. Flying toasters, sometimes, isn't it great? <laughs> sometimes you want your toasters to fly, and your stables are never, ever going to do that for you. Um, the company developed um, uh, flying toasters, a company out of Berkeley, California, called California called After Dark. And this is, goes on and on, by the way. <laughs> They've got a theme song. And when I tell you what the program is, you're going to start giggling even more. <clears throat> the idea behind, behind um, Flying Toasters was it was a screensaver. Now, to explain what a screensaver is, I know you guys know what it is, but I want to describe it in terms of a VC pitch. And who's going to be my lucky VC? I'm going to pick on you, OK? I'm going to be talking to you. I want to pitch you on this idea. What's your name? No, you right there in the blonde. What's your name? El Alice? Alexis. All right, Alexis. You've got $10 million in VC money, and this is my pitch. Um, I'm going to do software, and I'm a very qualified software engineer. I've written a couple books. <clears throat> what I want you to do, here's the idea. I want to do a piece of software that's going to, um, that's going to really only be useful to users when they're not there. That's number one. So it's only going to be useful when they're not there. So the only value they're going to get is when they can't see it. Now, how am I going to make this more entertaining? Hold on. I know this is great. Calm down. Don't start writing checks yet. <clears throat> How this is going to be great is um, uh, it's going to blank the screen, and there's going to be things going on on the screen. Again, you won't be there. It's only useful when you're not there. And um, we're going to do flying toasters. <laughs> I know. I'm excited too, right? <laughs> flying toasters are going to be on the screen when you're not there. And by the way, there's going to be preferences to adjust the toast color and to have the number of toasts, and you can adjust the volume and everything. You won't be there at, at all, but it's, it's this amazing idea. It's, I know. Stop writing the check. Um, so what we're going to do, so, and it's going to be, uh, it's going to be $40 for each piece of software. Again, it's only useful when you're not there. It's saving your screen, but it's not there. So what do you, what do you think of this? Will you, will you fund my amazing idea? Alexis, no? Really? 99 cent app is what you're going to tell me? You're probably right. Thank you. Um, <laughs> they made millions of dollars on this idea. They made a million, millions of dollars. This is an absurd, stupid idea. Um, yes, they were saving screens back there, and screens needed a lot of saving back then. But it's only useful when you're not there. And it's there with toaster. And they got lost in it. Who in the right mind would have ever funded this idea? They didn't fund it, by the way. I'm assuming they just they pitched it to themselves. They did it on their own. It's amazing to me that this idea ever got out there. And of course, After Dark turned on all these other screensavers, and you don't know Jack, and they eventually sold it to Sierra um, years after. But I was really curious about who are the engineers behind this absurdly brilliant business idea. And it was the folks who did MoveOn.org. After they left, um, after they sold After Dark, after they sold Berkeley Systems, um, Wes Boyd, Joan Blades were the co-founders, and they went on clearly not leveraging uh, flying toasters enough. They, le they went on to following this uh, technology um, action technology-based action group is politically left. And again, I look at this, I'm like, that's crazy too. When Move On came out, I was like, no way they can do anything there. And now it's sort of a standard in terms of getting involved with politics with technology. Volatiles. They come up with the craziest ideas. Here's the bad news.
Here's the problem. You need both of these folks. These guys and gals hate each other. <laughs> they really just don't get along. They, I, most of my professional career has been mediating battles between the stables and the volatiles who can't get along. Volatiles believe the stables are slow, lazy, and political, and they're bureaucratic. Stables believe the volatiles hold nothing, sac hold nothing sacred, do whatever the hell they want, company, team, product, be damned. Here's the thing, everyone's right. They're actually right. Now, I'm talking about archetypes again, but these are, this is, there's a spectrum of these, but they're right. These, this, is, this is what volatile, volatiles crave chaos. They're not going to be measured, they're not gonna be motivated, they're gonna do what they want. And when I describe it like that, you say, why in the world would you ever hire these people? But this is a huge amount of innovations coming on this planet right now, these folks who think that 140 characters is a great way to convey information. If you're planning on building or growing a team, you need both of these constituencies to thrive, you're cut to have your team, whether you're a small team or a big, huge team. There's this reward for shipping this 1.0 product that we talked about, and it's a bit of a curse. I have to look at my next slide, because I don't know which part I'm in this. So there's this curse. Now, if you go um, and you look at some of the companies I've been at, that's Borland. How many of you know Borland? Really? Huh, that's interesting. I did not pay you as a Borland crowd. That's great. I'm not very old then. All right, Netscape, show of hands. Of course. I was there early on. And then Apple, no one, anyone? I get it. <laughs> now, what's interesting about each of these stories, each of these is a story. There's a 1.0 that happened at each of these companies. <clears throat> and it took, in my opinion, a volatile to bring that thing into the world. At Borland, it was a guy named Philippe Kahn, and he, um, he said, listen, programming environments are awful. There's these terminals that are just incredibly hot. So we're gonna invent this concept, not invent, we're gonna adapt and make this concept of the integrated development environment. Eclipse folks here, Philippe Kahn was the guy who got that. And they turned into a behemoth in programming language and developer productivity. Interesting story about Philippe Kahn, just to prove that he is a volatile, <clears throat> After he got, after he left Borland, he went on to invent a thing called the camera phone. I mean, the, uh, the camera on the camera phone. He's the inventor of that little thing on the back of your thing right here. Philippe Kahn, this is what he did after he went and invented what I would consider to be some of the best uh, programming environments out there. Netscape, a bunch of kids from NCSA, under Mark Mandreessen saying, hey, I have this idea where we've got this thing called the web and I, I think it's gonna have all the information on the planet and I wanna develop the app to look at all the information, which sounds totally normal right now, but back then we thought he was crazy. And of course, um, PC invented, or the Mac invented, well, Apple II invented by Steve Jobs. Each of these companies had this significantly huge 1.0. Is this the seven o'clock crowd showing up? <laughs> there was some marketing that said I started at seven. They're gonna be disappointed. All right, um, each of these had a story um, of their 1.0, that thing that defined the company. And the thing, and it started with a volatile and someone who's gonna mix things up and say that flying toasters are important. But there's this interesting thing that happens, and this happens in big companies, and it happens in little teams around a 1.0. There's this transformation that occurs. What happens is, these companies, these things that started out being very volatile and being innovative and disruptive and all these things, slowly become um, stables. What happens? What goes on? Now what happens is the people, the volatiles who define this 1.0, whether it's an Apple II or a browser or whatever, it's 1.0 sucks. It's the worst part of your career will be building 1.0 because there's so many questions, there's so many things you have to do and it's really, really hard. So what happens is all these volatiles are swirling around like it's happening at Palantir right now, and all these other volatiles show up and say, hey, we want to disrupt and make things crazy. But there's this interesting thing that happens where the volatiles, we'll call them the old guard volatiles, see these other volatiles showing up, and they start mixing stuff and rebuilding frameworks and blowing stuff up, and the volatiles who become, are slowly become, the old guard volatiles become stables. They say, listen, <laughs> listen to me. You don't want to do this. You don't want to mix things up. 1.0 is awful, it's hard. I have the scars, because you bleed at 1.0. You don't want to do this. 
So what happens is these, vol these new guard volatiles slowly leave. And the company becomes, what does the company become? The company slowly becomes stable. This transformation from a volatile company to a stable company is really interesting to me because it's a way to turn away some of your best talent. Can I make fun of these guys? Is that cool? Not really. <laughs> I would say, this is my own opinion, not the opinion of this wonderful university, this is sort of a yard sale of mediocrity. <laughs> now, there's, you cannot argue for a second that these companies are wildly successful. These companies are doing amazingly well. Bit well, sort of. Not really well. But um, there's, a, there's hundreds of thousands of employees there and people that are working there and love their jobs and they're doing great work. <clears throat> but these companies, I would argue, have become, to their credit, very stable. They're doing amazing things. But here's the thing. Is there, name something that's come out of one of these companies in the last five years, you've gone like, wow. You've gone, oh my gosh, they totally changed X. Again, making lots of money, a lot of people gainfully employed and happy. But what is the volatility? How do you create that? How do you keep that? When you go and you look back at these companies I was all at, each of these companies, there's only one who actually made it through in my opinion. Borland, um, got, uh, it's still around by the way, it's still in Scotts Valley in California. Borland was going toe to toe with Microsoft, which was sort of in a monopoly at the time. And they're still around, but they're doing awful business cycle, blah, blah, blah stuff. Netscape got bought by AOL. AOL, that's sort of a fate worse, fate worse than death, getting bought by them. And then there's Apple, which um, I would argue was about to become irrelevant in 97, and then what did they do? They brought the volatile back, and he mixed everything up, and he brought them back from the brink, and did some crazy things. My question to you here is, my question to you is not whether you want to work at IBM or Apple, my question is, I want you to think about, do you or do you not want flying toasters? I kind of want flying toasters. This brings us back to this. This plug, which is actually this plug. What was going on here? Why did they choose to do this? Well, um, this side of the plug, not the USB side, but the other side, that's Thunderbolt? No, it's not Thunderbolt. What is it called? Lightning? Whatever it's called. Um, it's nice and it's two way, it goes in either way. It's thinner so they can have smaller devices. Um, is that the reasoning? Why they did it? Well, it's actually, they still have the plug situation going on here. There's more plugs showing up, so we're getting in that weird plug situation again. But why did they do this? What was their, what was their design decision behind this? What's the, or my question really is, when there was a lot of reaction online when this plug came out, what was the actual issue that people had with it? <clears throat> is this what they're doing? They're like, hey, we're going to trigger an upgrade cycle. We're a bunch of greedy bastards, and we're going to go have a bunch of people buy some new software. We're going to have a bunch of new... Uh, Hardware. This is not what Apple was doing. And they have a long history of not doing this. Now, of throwing away something that's working just fine. How many of you remember this iPod? This was, I think, the pinnacle of iPod design. This is the last one that had a hard, no, it wasn't the last one. Classic still has it. This is the last one of the mini uh, framework that had the hard drive in it. It was this metal, had a great weight to it. and. Um, on September 7th, 2005, Steve Jobs got up on stage and he killed it. Now, the MBAs of the crowd <laughs> would, have, would have looked at this chart, which has shown revenue over time and volume and demand, and all these interesting things, which would have shown that what we knew, which was we couldn't keep it, in, we couldn't build them fast enough, we couldn't keep them in the stores. It was at the time the most popular consumer electronics device on the planet. But rather than, um, and he killed it, gone. We were just, what? I mean, it was, it was still built, you couldn't, there were certain colors that you just never even saw in the store. What he did during that time when he was announcing the iPod mini was he showed um, what um, MP3 players looked like at the time when it was released, 
and he also showed what they looked like now about a year or so later. And what do you think happened? What happened was, and this is a battle Apple continues to fight, is all the, all the MP3 players started to look like the Mini. And he was tired of playing this game, of like waiting for them to catch up, filing patents, doing all this sort of stuff. And he said, okay, rather than that, we are actually going to, we're just gonna replace it. So rather than giving them time to catch up, what he decided, volatile-wise, volatile was to change the game. This is clearly not a stable person at work. Now, <laughs> I mean, that is the nicest compliment, too. They did it before. This wasn't an iPod. They, do, they keep on doing this. The battery business. How many of you had a, a MacBook Pro, the 17-inch one? Anyone in the room? One person here? Let me tell you. It's a really big MacBook Pro. It was huge. It was like we called it the pizza box. And um, they, um, <laughs> what they did with, I forget which version is, they said the battery is no longer removable. And all of us nerds lost our minds. We said, you're taking out the battery? What if I happen to be on a 17-hour flight and I need more batteries? It doesn't make any sense. And they said, calm down, trust us, this lithium, this lithium polymer battery is actually gonna give you plenty of time for your flight. And we didn't believe them, we got all foamy at the mouth, and they were right. They, they were right. They said, we, no, one's, no one's buying batteries. And by the way, this was a huge $100 million business, this battery business, and marking up batteries and reselling them that they could do. But it was more important to them to actually go and do the right thing. And also, and they do this all over there, you can see this all over their technology stack, they learn as they build. This lithium ion battery is a cloth battery, which means you can fold it in all sorts of interesting ways, and you can shove more of the battery in. Now, why would the 17 inch MacBook be a place to do this? Well, it's a good place to start, lots of space, but what they were working on was what we all were a, a, a shocked by with the iPhone, which was how much, how, they were trying to figure out how do we get maximum amount of battery inside of that iPhone. This is what they were working. They were monetizing their research. Volatiles at work. The thing about Apple that you need to know is Apple desperately doesn't want to become stable. Now, if you want to worry about Apple, the question you have right now is whether they're becoming stable or not. That seems to be the meme on the street right now. I don't want you to become stable either, by the way. You need both of these folks. You need both of these, whether you're on a team of two or four or whatever, or a team of 40,000, you need both populations to be able to work together. Your stables are there to remind you about reality. Hi, Tim. <laughs> and to define process, whereby large groups of people, very large group of people, can be coordinated to actually get work done. These are, this guy is the world's best project manager on the planet. Your stables bring predictability and credibility and repeatability to your execution. And you need to build a world where they can thrive. This guy's running one of the most important, in my opinion, companies on the planet because he has the ability to make sure that come tomorrow, we could all have in all of our stores as an iPhone there for us to go buy. Or there's just enough to create demand and buzz or whatever. This person is a uber major and totally demeaning and project manager is an operational genius and they gave him the whole company which I think is interesting you need obviously volatiles as well your volatiles are here to remind you that nothing lasts and they consider that their mission in life to replace that which is, which is, is inefficient um, boring and uninspired this is what I think what Steve was doing a lot of the hardware and software was like, you know, this isn't, I'm just not feeling this anymore. And there's no good business decision to define this, but we're going brushed metal because it feels great. Brushed metal everywhere. Let's go. <sighs> Crazy. Um, you need to build a corner of the building where these two groups of people, where these folks can disrupt and everyone is clear about the value of disruption. These pokes tend to get fired. He got fired. And there's a lot of, I think, conventional uh, wisdom that says these folks that are sort of disrupting and they don't seem to like people are, need to be let go because they're just pissing people off. You need to have these folks here within reason. You need to build a world where these both groups, both of these constituencies, this, these two archetypes, can thrive. You need to have, they need to, you need to build an appreciation of the other side of the fence where 
where the volatiles can go look over the fence into the stables, cubes, or offices and look and go, hey, wow, you're stable. This is so tidy in here. Everything is so tight. Everything is clean. All your pencils and pens are in the sink. I can't even think with this level of cleanliness. How do you, how do you get anything done? And then the stables go over to the volatiles, offices, cubes, whatever, and they go like, what a horrible mess. Where's your computer? How do you do anything in here? This is, this is I can't even think. It's, I mean, that's like 14 coffee cups in a row there? What do you do? Is that a flying toaster? No way. You need to figure out, you need to explain, and I explain this a lot with folks, these two battles, that what is the relative value of each of these folks? You need to figure out how to throw stuff away that you cherish. This is something that Apple taught me, and this is something we continue to do at Palantir, is these things that we build can't control us. We cannot sit here with our 1.0 and think that like, we've done it, because all we've done it is it for right now. This is a great way to create volatility, is to say, right, it's good, we're doing well, we can do a lot better, we're gonna start over. It's a hard decision to sell to your board, <clears throat> but it's something that we do a lot. We need to figure out how to give your team, your coworkers, whatever, blank slates to think about the world. There's this uh, thing at, when Steve came back in 97, um, they had a five-year sabbatical program at Apple. And what they found when they looked at the data was that when someone would get to five years, which is two years too long, <clears throat> they would go and take their three, six-month sabbatical. They'd come back, and they'd quit. <laughs> so what was the point of the whole sabbatical? Now, at Palantir, we're getting to people that are getting to three years or so, and we're starting to get that itch because they've read my stuff, and I'm like, I actually have a report that tells me when people get to two and a half years, and what we do is we go up and we say, hey, Frank, you're at two and a half years. We're putting you on a blitz. I don't know what's going on here. I know you've got pain over here. I know it's important you support this customer. You're going on a blitz, and you get three months, and you can pick a set of people that can join you, and you can build whatever you want. You get three months. It's Google 20% time reimagined because they actually get to choose and do whatever they want. If they want to go build Angry Birds, no one's going to say no. Now, I hope that they work within the Palantir space, and so far they have. And here's the thing. We did three different product lines have come out of people being on a blitz, choosing, not saying, hey, the right thing to do is cyber or this or that. They chose it, they built something, and it wasn't done. It was a prototype after three months, but we've gotten product out of this. And I'm not even worried about product. All I'm trying to do is keep the talent in the house for as long as I can, because I know this clock is ticking, and at three years, especially in the Silicon Valley, they're probably gonna go do something else. So when I'm giving them blank slates. There needs to be equal representation and investment in stables and volatiles. You need to have this balance between these two folks. The thing about that slide with Oracle and IBM and HP, I'm sorry, I know they're amazing companies, is there's a, there's a smell to it of stagnation, right? And that scares the heck out of a lot of our volatile types. And you need these folks to disrupt things. When I look at this, humans, humans are bad at making decisions individually. This is probably a function, obviously, of geography that we ended up with this nasty plug situation. This is the end result of uncoordinated decision making. No one's project managing this at all. Where the stables ruled and the volatiles, the person who can actually come and say, hey, I'm gonna solve this plug thing once and for all. And I know there's all of these economic issues and this sort of thing. It's some crazy idea that I can't even conceive of. But there's a volatile out here who actually has a plan to solve this problem. I don't know what it is, but how does it make it so we have a single plug? I'm not saying we have to go do that, but there's someone who could actually put that together. Builders, all of you, are in a um, unique position to change the world, to build things. And it's software, whether it's hardware, whatever your engineering discipline is, you need to figure out. You're gonna be working with other people. You need to figure out where both sides are represented, whether you're stable, you are very volatile. We need, we, need, we need more people building amazing things. I think, we need, I think we need more flying toasters. Thank you very much.
This just goes on and on. I'm, uh, I can do Q and A, is that right? I'm gonna stop this, it just goes on. There's actually, so you know, there's actually lyrics. There's actually a song that goes along with this. So anyway, um, I'm happy to answer your questions about Apple, Palantir, innovation, disruption, why I hate IBM apparently. Um, hi, what's your name? Dennis. Hi Dennis. Uh, Wozniak totally stable, um, um, but very, inf very, um, very. Uh, on the well, so the thing that I, I don't know either. I mean, I know Steve. I don't know about Wozniak at all. I should have just left it up. That's going to be annoying. Can we just make that black? <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> um, Wozniak, um, I would say, is a stable. I don't know the guy. I'm just looking at the data, um, but he was totally manipulable by jobs in terms of pushing him and kind of in terms of pushing him in a direction. I think he's a brilliant design type, but it's like you look at everything since then without Steve and what is what has dazzled you? I think it was a perfect combination of a stable and a volatile. But that's my opinion. Other questions? Design, Apple, anything you want to talk about? No? Yeah, in the front row. So uh, you talked about uh, how to support people's transition. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Giving them, giving them three months to do whatever they want. Yep, yep. Do you support the transition back? And if so, how? Um, so we, the question is um, the blitz concept of letting someone go do something for three months and um, what you do at the end of that, because they've just had three months to do whatever they want. How do they go back and get back in the regular thing? We make it really clear up front that there's a contract about how long they'll be able to do it. If you're having, a, one of the rules around volatiles, if you have someone who's not willing to uh, do the, the dirty work or the grunt work ever, that's probably not someone who's gonna really work well at a team. You, there's folks that you have to, if in a small team, you have to have the folks that are willing to take the licks. So that's how we do it right now. It's like, hey, you're gonna be able to do this three months and then you have to go back on search because we need your expertise there. So that's how it's working right now. Answer your question? Cool. Other questions? Anything else? Too big of a, yeah, in the front row, third row. <laughs> the question is, uh, there's advantages to being a stable and there's advantages to being a volatile. Do I have any advice? Um, you uh, Stay volatile as long as you can, <laughs> would be my advice. The stables are just going to show up. They're, you're outnumbered. Um, so um, I would say, not, I'm not saying like be a jerk all the time, but, <laughs> but there's lots of folks out there that are going to ask you to kind of fit into the system, into how things work. And the longer that you are volatile, I think the happier you're going to be. I feel like this advice is going to come back and bite me, by the way. <laughs> MBA. <laughs> Stables versus volatiles, to some extent, seem to change like creatives versus uh, sure. you know, yeah. system types, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. You know, it, I almost get the you know the whole um, what's the aphorism that says you know a man of twenty who's uh, conservative has no heart, a man of fifty right. who's uh, liberal has no brain. Right. I, I almost feel like that's what you're saying with stable and volatile. Is that it, this you is have kind of a young disruptive sure, sure. person, and then eventually they become boring. So and this know, this gets sure. into the why I call it archetypes so much is. At the end of the day, what I really see is that people kind of are a mix of the two, and there's times and places where they're volatile, and there's times and places where they're stable. I am I, I, I'm a volatile that has really, I can fake stable really, really well, and I can switch whenever I need to. Um, I would prefer to be volatile, but the thing is, it depends on the situation, it depends on the person, and, it, and it's not black and white. Um, I think there is, to the point of the blitz, I think there's a time where people, whether you're stable or all, you have to have that like blank slate moment of like refreshingness. Or otherwise you're gonna go do it for yourself. You're gonna leave your job, you're gonna go do something else. So it, it people are beautiful snowflakes and it it's there's there, there, there's a mix, there's a mix of people with each one. So there also seems like you know, you mentioned that you need both and you need to mm -hmm. you know, in harmony. Yep. It seems like the the ratios would vary depending on yep. the, the age of your company yep. and 
Yeah, so the question is, his, um, it seems like the ratios are very dependent on the size and the age of the company. I think, um, I think Apple is doing really well with, I would say, like true hardcore volatiles, like 30 to 50, like folks that are like out there on the secret projects, they go in that dark place for three months and poof, out comes the, well, nine months and out comes the iPhone. But that's like a small set of folks. The majority of Apple, I would say, is stable leaning. So, but it varies, right? The way that, they, way that secret projects work, I work at Apple now, I can talk about it and not get fired. It's pretty sweet. Um, um, is what they would do, and this was actually in my notes, I didn't say it, what they would do, what Steve would do, is he would actually create two teams to work on the same problem. So you're gonna be on iPhone team one, and you're gonna be on phone team two, and this really happened, and they go in for six to nine months into their places, and then they have like a cage fight. <laughs> not really, but they, but, so those two teams know that they exist, so what is he doing there, right? He's not only does he have them, you know, it's kind of cool to be on a secret project, they have the competition there as well. So um, that's a lot of the way, that's one of the ways he actually kind of got, you know, things done there, so. Way in the back. Yep. Ah, ooh, I love this question, which usually means I don't have a good answer for it right out of the gate. Um, the question is, what would you, how would you, how would you vet for volatility in the company? Um, so that's hard. It depends on the size of the company. Um, if it's really, really small, you're going to interview with him or her, and you're going to know who they are immediately because you're probably not going to like them much because they're going to really grill you on things and they're not going to do the EQ thing. They're going to just like go straight deep on algorithms and they're going to just be brutal about it. Um, <clears throat> in a bigger company, that's a really, that's a hard thing to do. Um, where are the volatiles hiding? They're probably not interviewing anymore because they've been pissing all the people off in the interview process. <laughs> so the question, I don't know, it's, it's it, in a bigger company, I don't know how, it's, you're, you're kind of doing it on inferred data, of like, wow, the product's still incredibly innovative, or this, the, the buzz around them is still really significant. I, I worry about this with Palantir. Three years ago, if I asked you what Palantir was, you guys would have all been in high school, which is sad for me. Um, but you wouldn't have known the company at all. We worked really hard on creating this brand and hiring the best and the brightest for six years now. And it's because we're trying to hire these folks. And it's like my full-time job is making sure these people stay here and continue to work on the world's hardest problems. And they, we try to get them into the interview process, but that's us deliberately doing it. I've seen a lot of times where the volatiles are either no longer there or it's just an echo of them. So I'm not really answering your question well, but let me think about it some more. Yeah. I'd ask how they incubate ideas, how they, how they go about doing product discovery or development. Yeah. And, and, and if they say, you know, some crazy clue over there, <laughs> Right. Let me kind of repeat that. Yeah. So his, his point is, ask them how they build product, and are you are you is it like yeah? Well, we have a 27-step process approved by the blah 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 institute. It's probably not a volatile anyway. They're, you're looking for a little uh, chaos, healthy chaos in the answer, I think. All right. Other questions. And one more question. Or not. Um, hard question. Wait, so you're asking about going to volatile, stable, and it never coming back? Is that what you're saying? That or a stable going volatile. A stable going volatile? Uh, it happens a lot. Um, <laughs> it, really, it really depends. I, I think it goes back to the blend thing. It's, I think people, I, the, the true hardcore volatiles that I really know, these people need to not work with other people. They need to be over and inventing the next light bulb by themselves in a dark place. And to me, it's, there's always a blend. To actually have it, them work in teams, there has to be, they have to at least, a volatile has to be able to appreciate a stable, which means they, ha they have some give one direction or the other. So I think, I think there's probably true, just pure volatile and stables out there, but the ones that I think are better uh, fits for a team are ones that kind of can vary back and forth. So thank you all. I think I'll be up here answering more questions, and I really appreciate your time. You've got a beautiful, beautiful facility here.